And Lee's back. Did that work? There's Rebecca. There's Rebecca. All right. We have. Um, They're good. We're, we're, we're hearing that they can see everybody now. Okay. Oops. Yeah. We'll see if Nancy shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I promise everybody I'd, we didn't do anything differently it just uh you know technology uh technology this is um this is maybe gonna make the perfect story for my sermon next week on the reading from peter about our adversary prowls around <laughs> yes yeah yeah oh man yeah but God love you all for your patience and uh, sticking with us. Thank you very much for, oh, there's Nancy again, who has logged in. Nancy, I'm promoting you again. I don't know why you keep showing up as an attendee and not as a panelist. Um, Nancy, can you turn on, um, turn on your sound and turn on your video? Working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it. Oh, there she Yay! is. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. We're all here. Looks good. It's a miracle. It is and a you miracle. know, it's only 1016. So it's like all it's that really and we're still pretty much on time. Good, good, good. Wow. Hey, yeah. Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, we'll give it just one more minute to let all the people who were on it a minute ago get back on it now. And, uh, and then we'll start just a couple minutes late. Oh, hello to the Robins and the Holly in Colorado. Wonderful to um, have all of y'all together. And I know it's wonderful for you to be together. My goodness. Give that, give all of those sweet kids, those Holly kids, a big hug from their friends at Transfiguration. All right, we'll give it one more minute. I couldn't think of a good backdrop today, and so I just put myself in transfiguration. So I just wasn't quite sure where to go. And so at, at Christmas. Yeah, so I, you know, Christmas, exactly. That's great. Sorry. I mean, I could try to make up a like a uh, deeply symbolic or theological reason why like the church at Christmas is um, is appropriate for today but I'm just going to go ahead and confess it's because it's the best thing I could think of <laughs> yeah. it's beautiful mm -hmm. sure is all right well then let's um, let's get started shall we and uh, I'll do my little intro, and that'll give the last few people a chance to um, to join us. Um, I just want to say a hello to all of you who are back on this week, back with us. Um, wonderful to have you. 39 uh, different currently um, attending right now, uh, possibly many more than that if there's like the um, Robins and the Hollies, um, a bunch of you gathered together in one place. So hello to you all for this fourth and final session of this frankly, too brief uh, um, class on uh, reconciliation. Um, and uh, just getting to this fourth week of this exploration has just reminded me how, how bottomless the depths are of this topic um, and how um, multitudinous are the different um, uh, cases, examples, complications, um, and everything to it. So Lee, the order has been tall. You have been up to it, but it's um, it's hard to to even begin to um, to get one uh, one's feet truly wet in in a topic as big as this. But I'm so grateful for all of you who have attended these last four sessions and these last three sessions, and then again on this fourth one. By way of reminder, now that we think we have our technology right, you can chat with us using the little bottom uh, little button on the bottom that says chat. Offer comments. Offer reflections. 
um, offer uh, resources if you know of a book or a movie or, or an article or anything else. And we will be trying to respond to you in the context of that chat as we go along. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button and that then singles or pulls questions out and enables me to really keep track of them better so that when we pause periodically in the class, um, I can just go straight to those, those questions and we can try to focus in on what it is that you're struggling with or what questions you have. Um, uh, if you want to raise your hand, you can, and that's also totally fine. Um, I would say the easiest way though to sort of um, offer your, your question though is to use that Q&A Q &A function. A reminder that um, uh, this is being recorded. We are posting all of these on our website. If you want to revisit previous classes, I encourage you to do so definitely. And today's class will be posted probably tomorrow um, uh, when we get all of them up together. Okay, um, do I pivot to Nancy next to recap where we were last week? Yes. Go for it, Nancy. Okay, well, this is gonna be very quick. We are, um, at the point where we, last week, we looked at how we are called to forgive and how difficult and complex that can be. Um, we were offered a model by Everett Worthington called REACH, and I'll let you listen to the uh, recording from last week to figure out what REACH stands for, but um, so much rich information, and um, I, I echo what Casey just said. Thank you so much. And now to Mother Rebecca to um, pray us in, I believe. Indeed. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. 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 Well, Lee, we do welcome you back this week for this, our final session. Uh, most of you recall, but if you're new to this last session only, know that Lee is an attorney who left his practice to attend Harvard Divinity School and who has since focused his life's work on reconciliation and forgiveness. So we truly are hearing uh, the advice and counsel of a sage in this area. Welcome back, Lee. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Our session today, as I understand it, will focus on uh, a reading from Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. And I believe we have a slide for you uh, with that text. Hear now the words from Matthew. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here ends the reading. Thanks, Rebecca. So when you all hear the word reconciliation, what comes to mind? 
has lots of different meanings. To some, to be reconciled means to be resigned to something, you know, to, even to something not desired. To an accountant, reconciliation means an internal record meets, matches an external one. To a lawyer, particularly a family lawyer, what reconciliation means is that people who were separated, spouses who were once apart, have decided to come back together. To a Christian theologian, it gets super complex. Reconciliation is a theological claim grounded in atonement theology. It's the, it's the idea that by when I sin, I am reconciled to Christ through Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. There are wonderful biblical stories about reconciliation, yet even these are complex. There's a story of Esau and Jacob. One steals the other's birthright. There's a break. There's a threat of revenge. There's a separation. There's a return. There's an eventual peace. Yet even in the peace, they choose to live apart. There's a story of Joseph and his brothers, a brother thrown into a pit. A pit. Brothers who leave, brothers who would like one, leave one for dead. There's a story of their how they are reunited, how they come back into relationship. But then there's this question. Would they have come back into relationship had Joseph not held all the power? There's a story of the prodigal. You know, we dug deeply into that a couple of weeks ago. He was reconciled to his father, but not his older brother. I've told you a bit about my story, and my story is a part of all three of these. Well, there was a kind of reconciliation eventually between me and my parents. Um, it is a little bit like Esau and Jacob. We did come back together, but we lived very far apart. And like Jacob and his brothers, I wonder if we would have come back into a relationship at all, if they had still held power over me, or if because I then held the power, was I able to restore and step and be willing to risk coming into a relationship. And then like the prodigal, I've had some reconciliation with my parents, but I never have had with my sister. There's a pattern among these stories, and it's a pattern that I think I want us to, to look at, that there, there's, a, there's a break, there's an alienation, there's a memory, there's a coming to ourselves, this, this notion of repentance, there's a decision of mercy, and there's peace. Casey, there's a, a slide that shows that quickly. When we're thinking of this, though, and, and before I go into a further conversation about this, I want us to, to think about that even though in these weeks we've talked about we've talked about the languages of forgiveness and we've talked about forgiveness and we've talked about repentance and granting repentance there's a way in which that i have had an academic orientation to it and i want to make sure that we understand that when we're in these conversations there's they're deeply bound in mystery and when we come to this conversation about reconciliation nowhere will that be more clear that there is a mystery to what happens. It is something that we can identify elements, but when we really start to witness reconciliation and we are a part of it, we have to be, there is this sort of awareness that there is this mystery, that God is in the midst of it in some way that we don't really even need to understand. We simply need to be watching and seeing. So as I talk about this, I want to make sure that I tag that there is this, this notion of mystery. In the story of the prodigal, Jesus, opened, Jesus officers offered us explicit steps in how to repent. And through the parable, we understood the interrelationship between sin, repentance, forgiveness, and restoration and reconciliation. In Matthew, with, with, with what Rebecca just read, Matthew gives, Jesus gives more specific directions that when a community is broken, what are the steps to repair? So here's what Matthew says, you know, in, in Jesus is saying, you go to the other. There's no gossiping. There's no triangulating. The first step is that I go to you. Um, if you refuse, if you aren't able to hear me in that conversation, then what I do is I bring another with me. And if we're still refused, we go to the community. And if there's still a refusal, then what Jesus says is that we treat that person as a pagan or a tax collector. But let's be really clear. Many or many churches will use this as a shaming statute and a shunning statute, and it isn't that at all. Remember how Jesus hung 
with pagans and tax collectors, relentless pursuit, a relentless engagement, uh, dinners, suppers. So remember that that's, that's the, this invitation when we start talking about reconciliation, there's a relentless call to return. So as we've discussed, remember forgiveness can be either an intra experience, something that goes on just within me, or it can be an inter, re, interpersonal experience. Sometimes, so remember, I can make a choice to forgive you without regard to your repentance. I can make a choice that even in the, in, in the, in the wake of your repentance, I can make a choice not to return to relationship with you. And sometimes I want to be clear that sometimes the choice to not resume relationship with someone who has caused great harm may be a smart and wise choice. Think of the victim of domestic violence. Yes, maybe he says, baby, I'm sorry. But is baby, I'm sorry, an adequate reason to return to relationship? So she may make a decision inside of her to forgive, but make a, deci a decision for her safety and her children's not to resume relationship. Forgiveness can also be an interpersonal experience. And that is that I can choose to forgive and I can choose to return to relationship and risk all that may require. So again, forgiveness is both an intra and an interpersonal experience. But when we come to forgiveness and reconciliation, remember that in the religious language that we talked about in our first week together, when we talked about the religious language of forgiveness, always, while individuals are healed, and within the Christian tradition, the person who is always healed by forgiveness is the party who has caused sin. That's, that's what it is. But remember that from a religious language of forgiveness, the telos isn't on me as an individual like it is as in a psychological language. The telos is on us, on us individually and on us as a community. The idea is, is that if you and I are broken, we, us, the community is also broken. So when we consider Matthew's, you know, Jesus is teaching Matthew, the starting place, the, where we have to begin is the centrality of relationship. Reconciliation work is, is relationship centric. It isn't something I do in isolation. It requires, it requires you and it requires me. Without us talking about us, there is no talk of reconciliation. Talk of, of reconciliation without the us is nonsensical. So if we can agree that reconciliation work is quintessentially relational, then a defining quality of reconciliation process has to be the rebuilding of trust or at least the building of a willingness to risk trust. And that might be the more accurate thing. Am I willing to risk trust? Think of a time when you've been deeply hurt and when you and the person who hurt you, yet you, you, you found your way back into relationship. I mean, we've all had this, we've all had breaks and we've all found our way back. Think about it. In order for that to happen, you had to risk trust, right? Think about Jacob and Esau. Jacob had to trust that Esau had relinquished his desire for revenge. Esau had to trust that Jacob had truly repented and had not come to steal something more. To be willing to risk trust, the prodigal's father had to trust the authenticity of the prodigal's repentance. He had to trust that he meant it and meant that things were going to be different. So before we consider what it takes to risk trust, so I just want to pause for a second and see if there are any comments, questions, you know, where we are here before we, we look at this. What, what does it take to be willing to risk trust? Casey, anybody popping in here? Nothing yet. Um, uh, I think we're, we're all um, coming along with you. I feel myself coming along with you, but I don't see any questions um, or comments yet um, to share. Okay. Um, okay. So what does it take to be willing to risk trust? The starting place, I think, is there has to be a cessation of violence. The trespass must stop. The affair has to be ended. The alcohol or drugs or sex has to be put down. The abuser has to have made a choice to repent from the abuse. There must be a clear evidence that recovery has begun. It's always a risk. I mean, there's, there's just, there, there's just always, there's always a risk. There's always a sort of a not for sure, don't know. 
think about it. So a woman who is making a decision to return to relationship with someone who has, there has been domestic violence, there's risk, but she is still willing. But we still, if, if she's being well advised, she's going to be told to still keep spare keys someplace, still keep some cash. Just while she's waiting, there is a waiting while we wait to be sure that the violence has really stopped. Another element, memory must be restored and honored. Truth, we have to, we have to do it. Always when we are talking about ruptures, there is, there is, there is, there's a kind of a lie that is told. The narrative, this narrative of the lie must, re, must be replaced with a new and redemptive narrative. Narrative. You know, think about this. Think about, you know, you know, we've heard about gaslighting, right? It's when an abuser will tell the person who's being abused that the reality that she or he sees isn't the reality that it is. That's what gaslighting is. So. That's a, there's a narrative in there. There's a narrative that's a lie, that what you see isn't true when what is true is true. And so that narrative, the lie, there has to be a boundary put around it. And a new narrative has to come forward, the narrative of truth. Think about it just where we are today. How is our nation going to be reconciled? Think of the different narratives that are going on in our country right now. We have leaders who don't wear masks, Leaders who are willing to tell us that the virus is a hoax. We don't need to shelter. And then we have leaders like the president of New Zealand, leaders like the governor of Michigan, leaders like the governor of New York, leaders who are willing to, to lay down their own political lives for the lives of those they govern. This is the narrative of truth that has to be elevated and the narrative of lie has to be put away. So a new and redemptive narrative built on truth must come forward cessation of violence the narrative of truth justice the third item that we have to consider the problem when we start talking about justice is what if we only talk about justice what if that's what we talk about what if we what if we just what if we just talk about mercy this is a tension that comes in what if, you know where we're supposed to grant mercy do justice but without mercy Justice is rigid and hard. And without justice, mercy is saccharine and soft. So they must coexist. We have to have this. A huge conversation that goes on around reconciliation work is the sequencing of justice. There's this question, must justice be complete before we can really have reconciliation? The model I showed you, you know, before, remember at 12 o'clock we had harm and at Three o'clock, we had repentance, and at six o'clock, we had forgiveness, and at nine o'clock, we had reconciliation. Well, so this is a this is a, a this is the thing. Remember, so I my model has repentance happening at three o'clock. There are those who would suggest that what should happen is that forgiveness should precede repentance, and so that my forgiveness invites you into repentance. There is that notion, Robert Schreider, who does piecework, that's one of the things he, he, he suggests. Gene Hampton, a legal philosopher, says that I, who have been abused by you, should forgive you and come back into your presence and let you see the mirror of Christ in my face by my forgiveness and you are incentivized to repent. So that there is this notion of justice, does the justice of repentance proceed or follow, or is it coexist? How do we sort it out? So I'm wanting to make sure that we, we see tension. So, this, so the essential identifying elements in reconciliation are truth, justice, and mercy. John Paul Lederich is a Mennonite. He's a teacher. He's an international peace leader. He's, he's someone that I like to read on this, and I invite you to, to read him as well. Here's the way he says it. He says, truth looks backwards. It's about remembering what to remember and how to remember. Justice is about now. We how, you know, the, the question justice asks is, what can make the wrong right? What can restore balance in a damaged relationship? Mercy, he says, is looking forward. It's how can we coexist? We know from the Samaritan that mercy is love and action. The psalmist joins the themes this way. Mercy and truth are met together. 
Justice and peace have kissed. How beautiful. Mercy and truth are met together. Justice and peace have kissed. Ah. The goal of reconciliation work is not to forgive and forget. Again, from Lederich, I quote, it's about, far more, it's, it's about the far more challenging adventure into the space where individuals and whole communities can remember and change, not forgive and forget. How do we remember and change? Today, change leaders are even pushing against the very word reconciliation. Today, the preferred, preferred word is transformation. The Kellogg Foundation has partnered with Dallas and other cities across the country to engage in a process of racial healing. At first, what was going to be the name of these groups where well, they were going to be called, it was going to be called Truth, Racial Healing and Reconciliation. But there was a pushback on the word reconciliation because reconciliation, again, remember that first definition we talked about, it can become reconciled to that, which isn't quite enough, but it's like, okay, well, we're reconciled to this is the way it is. And what leaders around race are saying when it comes to this kind of work, no, that isn't enough. We have to have change. There has to be transformation. So in Dallas, the group isn't truth, racial healing, and reconciliation. It's truth, racial healing, and transformation. So that's what we're up to. Remember what Bishop Tutu, when we talked about what Bishop Tutu said to us, you know, and I was sharing that with you. Remember why he said that the reason that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually failed, and the reason he predicted that it would fail and it has failed, is because what was required for, 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 the, for people to come forward was to tell the truth. It was not required that they had repented of their behavior. There was not required that they had to have a change of heart. What was required when they came forward was to tell the truth. And so without a change of heart, and that's the change of heart that we talked about in repentance, that idea that it isn't just a turning away from, but it's the metanoia. It's with a fundamental change of mind that I will not be who I was, that I'm going to be a new person. That that is what is called when we're coming forward in reconciliation. It isn't, it isn't just turning, it's turning with a change of heart. You know, it's as later it says, it is to remember and change. That's, that's really what we're, we're called to do. Without that change of heart, without transformation, the reconciliation process is destined to fail. So there has to be a willingness to change. So again, I wanna pause and you know, before we talk about sort of the people, um, I'm just wanting to come back and check in and see questions, thoughts, comments. Al uh, has a question about the, the definition of trust. So, you know, you began this cycle with, a, um, with the sort of need to reclaim trust, but um, what, is, what is trust um, in your mind? Did, did this, does Al want to come at what it is for him? I mean, for me, trust is a willingness to risk. Trust is a process. It's not an event. If we have a brokenness between us, part of what I think is with trust is I have an openness in my heart, a willingness to risk with you, and it is going to be a series of steps. It isn't going to be an event. I, I'm not going to go from this is who it was to this is how we are. I'm going to watch, and I will do it incrementally. You know, and therapeutically, what my therapist encouraged me to do around trust was that when I was willing to restore relationships, to do it incrementally, to take steps and just keep building. But at some point, I'm in. And then, 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 then you're in. That's a piece of what I think it, it is. I don't know what Casey, you know, Nancy, Rebecca, I don't know what your thoughts are and how you would say, how you would talk about what de defining trust. Um curious what the others think. I think of it in terms of a process as well, Lee, as you were, have been teaching so far, I can't help but remember when I was an adolescent and would break a rule that applied to me. And my mother would say to me, you know, it isn't just that you broke this rule. It's that you broke the relationship of trust that we have. And you now have a process to go through to reestablish that trust. 
And um, as I've grown into parenting, I've realized that was true. There were things that I, as the offender, had to do to reestablish trust. But there were also steps that she had to take as the in the in the setup in the language you're using as the victim of the breach in extending trust to me slowly and and bit by bit over time until the relationship was solid again. And so I think you've defined it beautifully. And um, the only thing I'd add is that nature of it being a, a process that that has taken by both parties to come back together, to be woven back together again. Al, um, I want to uh, uh, unmute you, okay, so that you can speak into this, because I'm curious kind of where that question comes from, and if you have any um, additional perspective to share. You're going to need to unmute yourself. There we go. Um, I, I think trust is, is such a core component in, in relationship. But I think many of us, and I know myself growing up, trust was defined as someone doing what I expected them to do. And a violation of trust was when that expectation was not met. A realization was that they did what I expected them to do. That, of course, I think is a very unhealthy place to be. Uh, and that trust to me has always been learning to expect what the other person is able to give rather than what, or to do rather than what I expect them to do. And that's what I'm hearing in your conversation is that trust is this mutually arrived at place that provides clarity of understanding as well as expectation to both parties. Uh, and I think where the conflict comes in, it, it goes back to that statement we made, I think it was last week or the week before, of expectations or regrets waiting to happen, uh, that this is such a core component of, of what relationship building is about. The true understanding of what each party can and is able to give and what each party understands each will be able to give, if that makes any sense. Thanks, Al. Yes, I, it, it makes sense. Um, I guess that I, it's, if, if, my, if, if the way I define trust is just um, accepting that you will behave in a way that I think that you are capable of, of, of behaving, um, I guess what I want to just say back then is, I want us to be more ambitious about trust. Um, I think it isn't, you know, it, it's, it's right. If I'm dealing with a, with a 10 year old, I'm going to have a really different expectation about what that person is, is capable of. But I also want to be surprised. I don't want to limit someone's, um, I don't want to limit to trust just by an expectation of what I think you're capable of, but also what we both need to have in order to move forward. That's, I, I think that there's, I want us to be more ambitious about what it is and to also at the same time not be naive. I think there's that. Casey, is there, there more? Should I, I mean, tell me. Yeah, more. so uh, there's, a, there's another, I think, very important question that we'll pull through the rest of this. It certainly comes back to some of the previous conversations we've had about bigger scale um, uh, efforts at forgiveness and reconciliation. What do you do when your narratives of what is true are different? Um, what do you do when that effort at truth telling is um, met by um, uh, you know confusion or um, dissonance? That's the really great piece of what Jesus is teaching in Matthew, is that you and I can come together and we can have dissonance. We can our narratives of what are true are in conflict, and so what is really helpful about the role of a facilitator is for a facilitator to help negotiate that truth. There's a, there, are, there are some really cool models around how this works. So when you have groups like A and B, you have tribal, this is looked at in political context. It's also looked at when churches are broken and you're looking at church conflict resolution. And particularly when churches are split, you have group A and group B. Um, one of the, the, the ideas in that is that you, you create circles of A and B, but then what you do is that you blend them. 
So A, many members of A sit with B and many members of B sit with A. And then what happens is, is that you have some way of, of managing that only one person is talking and people tell their stories. And what happens when you, when you tell stories this way is you start really understanding perspective. And there's an invitation toward humility. So that I understand that. Remember what we talked about with victims and offenders. We, we talked about this idea of the magnitude gap. And that if you ask me what happened, my narrative as a victim can just become gigantic, that you become your offense. And I fail to see any part of you. And so what can happen through reconciliation facilitation, I think this is the, the wisdom and piece of what Jesus is teaching in Matthew, is that we come with someone else so that we have an opportunity for someone else to tell us that we have now lost sight of the humanity of the person and we've lost sight of their humanity and see them only as their offense. And so how do we do that? And that's this beauty, the beauty of these peace circles, of having people come together in peace circles and hearing perspective. And then as I sit quietly and listen, and then if, and it depends, what is, who am I in, as I'm sitting there, are my ears open? That there is that opportunity. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the, the, the last segment that I was gonna, that, I'm, that I wanted to present, is you know, sort of what about the people involved? You know, how are we to be? Um, and I think this question gets us there, but are there other questions we can, we can hit? No, I think that's good for now. And we'll, uh, we'll save the next block for the end. So what I'm hoping is, is that I'm, you know, as I go to this next section, that we'll come back. And there may be questions that are going on across the course. There may be, you know, the opportunity for us to, to have more conversation about all of this. So we've talked about this process. We've talked about this idea that we, we have to, we have to have transformation. We have to be, you know, this notion that we forgive and forget can't have it. Remember, the language of forgive and forget is always the language of an oppressor. An oppressor is always, let's turn the page, let's change the chapter. They're not interested in, in changing or transforming, they're interested in moving on. That's what's like, you hear it, like, can't you just get over it? That's the kind of thing that we hear, and that is in the language of oppression. But now remember, so what in, in Matthew, first, if, if, there, if we have a brokenness, I come to you. If we can't do it, then I bring another person and we come to you. And then we bring it to the community. And this is what we're talking about. And so what I want to do is that Jesus, when he's talking about this, we have categories of people. We have the parties who are actually in conflict, the victim and the offender in our language, um, and then those who accompany them in the, in the process. So I, th I thought it would be helpful to talk about sort of, you know, if we're, if we're going, to, going to, to talk about this, how do we talk about the people who are in conflict? And then how do we talk about those of us who are invited in with them? Um, so if I'm gonna come see you and we're broken and I'm gonna come see you and I want to prepare myself for that conversation, what am I called to do? What does God ask of me? God is inviting me into this very complex moment. He's inviting me to come walking toward you, not to walk away from you. He's inviting me to walk toward you. What is he asking? I think it's, you know, for me, I think about what, what, what God says in Micah. What God is asking us is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What does that mean? What does it mean to walk humbly? We tagged on this a minute ago when we started talking about perspective. I have to, this is so difficult for me when I am hurt. It is so difficult for me when I'm hurt to remember that I may not have it right. You know, when I'm hurt, I may be so, what has happened between us might be this big and what's happened between us might be this big, but it's, tag, it's tapped into something from my history that is this big. And so what looks like going on with us is like this, but all of a sudden it looks like this. So if I'm to walk humbly, if I am really to come and see you, then I have to remember that perspective is perspective. I have to remember that. It ha I have to remember that because I see it this way doesn't mean that's the way it is. I have to remember, remember this notion that, that he who has been injured has the capacity to distort and magnify. 
And remember that, that she who has caused injury has the capacity to minimize and disregard. So there is this thing that we have to talk about. So if I'm asking, what does God call me and to walk humbly, so perspective. After, I think it's really helpful for Worthington that what we talked about with reach, remember this, you know, the, there's an E in reach and it's empathy. And it's, so before I come to see you, I think it's helpful for me to at least wonder, why did you do what you did? What was going on with you then? You know, why might you have done that? Rebecca talked about this the first week, this idea of what she did with her boys when her boys were arguing and that she had them sort of go to their separate spaces and to think about what was going on, how they had caused injury to others, how they had been forgiven, and then to come back together. There's a way in which that taps into what is called the Buddhist Peace Treaty. The Buddhist Peace Treaty says that what happens when we rupture, that what we do is that we first go away, and I, the one who has caused suffering, think about what I have done, why I have done it. I, the one who am suffering, you know, the one that is, is the victim in our language, I have to think about other times when I have caused suffering. You know, how have I done that? I have to think about times where I have been forgiven and what that has meant for me. So there's this, to walk humbly, I think it is these kinds of ideas. And it's, this is, requires preparation. I don't just come showing up. We have, you know, Matthew, Jesus isn't telling us in Matthew, okay, we've had a rupture and I come over and knock on your door that very second. I have to settle down. I have to notice my anger. If I'm going to come into humility, I have to be able to somehow tap down my righteous indignation. So there's that. I think there's another element of, of what is required for me if I'm going to come to you and we're going to have this conversation. I think it's, it's called, so Miroslav Volf is a, is a peace worker. He's an educator and professor at Yale Divinity School. Another, someone that I, I love to read what he says. He says that what we have to have when we're doing peace work like this is that we have to have what he calls a willingness to embrace. I have to be willing when I come toward you to embrace you. I think that what he means by that is a willingness to love. I think that there's, remember in the idea of dialogue, that if you and I are going to be engaged in dialogue, I have to be willing to be converted by you. If I come to talk with you, if I am, if I am following Matthew, and if I'm coming to talk with you, and I'm only coming so that you hear what I have to say, and I, all I want you to do is listen. I am not really willing. I'm not doing what Matthew's asking. I'm not doing reconciliation work. What I'm wanting is to be on my soapbox. But if I'm really coming to you, I have to be willing to be converted by what you have to say. I have to be willing to have that radical openness. That's what I think Balf is talking about when he says that I have to have a willingness to embrace. I have to be willing to see this conflict through your eyes. I have to be willing, and boy, is this hard for me to do. I have to be willing to unclench my fists. Man, I come, I'm a lawyer. Man, I do, I know how to argue my case, and I know how to end up being right. But man, if what I'm seeking to do is just be right, that means my ears are closed. I, this, this notion that I have to be willing to unclench my fists and come to you like this and not like this. There's that, which is, I think, this willingness to, to embrace. I have to ask myself, am I willing to wait for justice? If I've caused harm, and if I know you're coming, what I think that we have to understand really deeply, if I'm engaged in humility, if I have caused you harm, I have to want justice for you. Maybe I can't make it happen today, but if I have caused harm, I will want you to have justice. I will, want, I will not want to turn away from justice. I want you to have it. How about me and you? What if we were asked to come? We have friends. They've, they've tried it. They've come to each other. It didn't work. They brought, you know, one person went. They brought another person. It didn't work. And now they're asking us to accompany them. This is why this is this word accompaniment comes in. I think that's the, the thing that we have to remember. You know, when God spoke to Jacob, 
God said, I will be with you. It wasn't like with the star, I'll be ahead of you. It wasn't, I'll show you the way. It's, I will be with you. I will accompany you. So it's so important to remember that when we are walking, when someone asks us to do this, we are accompanying them. We're not showing them the way. We don't know. This is our own humility. We don't know. We're accompanying them. I remember when I was a hospice chaplain, what was really complicated for me. I mean, as a lawyer, I was so used to being the expert. You always sat on the other side of the desk. I always had, knew what we were going to do. That was, that was my job. Not knowing was not a good trade in a lawyer. But when I was a hospice chaplain, what I had to do when I came to the threshold of the patient's door, I had to drop what I knew at the door. I had to, when I entered the room, I had to remember that the language that was being spoken was the patient's. The experience was the patient's. The knowledge was the patient's. What I was to be was a non-anxious presence. I wasn't there to try to ratchet them up, but you know, I was there to trust them, to trust their experience and to help them. I was to accompany them. And I think that that's it in this reconciliation work. We trust the parties. We trust their wisdom. We trust their experience. We trust that God is there and with us. That's what we're to do. And that brings in, I think, the, this other quality about us. You know, and what's going on is, is that we have to have patience. Lederick talks about it this way. He said, it's, he said, when you're doing reconciliation work, he said, it's like wandering in the desert. I love this because it's, you know, the wandering reminds us that we're wandering. You know, we're not on some theoretical, predetermined, political, outlined, structural path. We are wandering. And, you know, we're there. And we are, we're trusting that God is with us and God will provide. You know, that there's, so there's this, there isn't a formula here. This is the thing that we have to remember. His notion that we're wandering in the desert, then, the desert is expansive. So it also reminds us that what we have to do is we have to reframe our conception of time. So we can go, and if it doesn't work out in that minute, what we can't do is despair. We have to remember that, you know, conflicts are often long, of long duration. And so we can't expect to come in and in one single conversation, work out the conversation. All we can do is begin it. That's what we're really doing. So I remember, you know, Claypole said it this way. He said, despair is always presumptuous. So if you come in and you have a conversation and it doesn't turn out the way you think, it's not in. We just don't know. It's, you know, what is our willingness? What is our humility? Are we, are we able to be patient? That's what we're doing. When I started this conversation today, I wanted to talk to you about mystery. And it's because it's just, it is, I mean, I can know all this stuff. I mean, when, we can, when we're going to talk about, a, 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 you know, this reparative sequence, this movement around the clock from sin to repentance to forgiveness to reconciliation, I can outline that for you, and I can have an academic approach to that for you. And when we talk about repentance, we can look at the prodigal, and we can see the specific steps. We can talk about the languages of forgiveness. We can, we can contextualize this important conversation we've been having with, with theory and, there are, there, and, and with research and data and ideas, we can do that. But when it comes to this, this, this reconciliation, when, you, when it comes to seeing this, to participating in it, it's mystery. I think about, I don't know if you all have read John O'Donohue. I love John O'Donohue. I love reading what he says. And one of the things he says is he says that when you go looking for your soul and you start to go take that interior deep dive inside of you, remember, you know, what Alan Jones says is that our faces are the portals, you know, to, to mystery, that autobiography is our deepest mystery. And when we go deep inside and we're looking, what Donahue, O'Donohue says is that we cannot go with a flashlight. We always have to go with a candle. And so when we're doing this reconciliation work, it's like that. There's a treading softly here. There's a, there's a patience. There's a, who am I in this? What is my intention to be in this? 
how do I form myself in it? When I'm in the, when, I, when my family's in Northern Michigan in the early morning, when you're, when you're walking from, when I walk from across the, the, the sort of the, the early morning dew, there's spider webs in the trees. And as you're walking, if you turn and you want to look right directly into those spider webs in these early morning light, they disappear. But if you see them peripherally, they're there. And this is this thing what O'Donohue's talking about. This is about when we start talking about reconciliation. There is this deep mystery that you see it when it starts to happen. But I don't think we can make it. But we can start it. That's what Jesus is teaching in Matthew, how we form ourselves. Do I have the willingness to come to you when, I'm, when we're broken? Do I have the willingness to bring someone else? Do you have the willingness to accompany me in having us fix that which is we're broken? Because remember, we're not just fixing you and me. We're fixing us. That's, the, that's what we're up to. So this is this conversation we've been having moving toward this. And when we start talking about actually talking about reconciliation, I, I just can only tag it as mystery. But it is God with us. You know, this promise that God had to Jacob, I will be with you. And so God will be. So that's just, you know, and now, now back to questions, comments. You know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time together. Nancy, I, just, I saw your, um, your comment, which is a question and a comment at the same time. And I, I'm just, I'm, as I, I saw it, and then I was listening to Lee talking about the spirit of humility here at the end. And I, uh, you know, Nancy's chat and co question comment in the chat is, you know, can there be a situation in which the offender and the victim are sort of almost interchangeable roles, like where it's really blurry, um, which one is which? And, um, and I think the spirit of humility and empathy that you are calling us to that I think is, um, is gospel driven is one that might inspire us to see ourselves or to see the possibility that I could be um, not just uniquely one of the roles in the, in the dynamic, but that I have a, a place or a, I, I participate in the other role as well. I am not only and exclusively ever the victim, but that I have something about the offender within me, whether it's a, um, a situation that is really blurry, which is, I think, Nancy, a great question. But maybe, Lee, what you're inviting us to is that even, um, even in more situations than the truly blurry ones, but to invite us to imagine ourselves um, uh, with the spirit of humility that could see um, that we are not only one part of this dynamic. Complex. It's, it's a, that's a complicated question. There are times where there are people are victims. Children who are violated are victims. Um, people who are the victims of, of criminal conduct are victims. Someone who is raped is a victim. Um, it's one of the things that I think we have to be really careful when we start saying that it can become blurry. It can be. In interpersonal conflict, um, I can have a falling out with a friend. And I think it is important that we do do this piece that Nancy said, is that we do have to see our part. That's this, this portion of humility. But we also have to be super careful when we start saying, well, there are, you know, everybody's both a victim and an offender. Yes, it's true that because of my childhood violence, I can grow up and, and repeat it. That's why it's called intergenerational. That, that, is, that it is possible that that, what I experience as a victim, I can become then a perpetrator of. But I think it's really important that we're, we're careful here. But I think, so that's, and that may be the more extreme situation. I think more help, and, and I think though Nancy's question is super helpful, because I think that how I understand perspective is just that, that I realize that it is perspective. And remember, it's really difficult. When I am in victimhood, it's very going to be very difficult for me to see how I am also a contributor. That's why you as facilitators, you as our priests, um, we as Christians, brothers and sisters, who when someone comes to us to talk, 
we have to be careful. We have to see what values are at stake in these kinds of conversation. So honesty, integrity, matter, courage. If I am telling you what has happened to me by someone else and you see my part, you have to have the courage to say, Lee, listen, honey, you, you got it mostly right, but what about this piece over here? And that's tricky because when you say that, I'm gonna go, what? But it's the invitation. It's the invitation for you to have the courage with me to help me see myself. And Al-Anon, we say it this way at the beginning of every Al-Anon meeting. It says that we ask that we see ourselves as we truly are and not as we want others to see us. And it's that. It's that, this work that you, as if I come to you and I say, I need your help, that I'm inviting you to have the courage to say to me, you don't see it exactly. You see it pieces, but you don't see exactly. Is that what you're meaning, Nancy? Am I, am I touching on that? Yeah, I certainly don't think that we call an offender someone who's a victim of abuse or horrible things that happen. But in the everyday kinds of ruptures that can happen in relationships, particularly in the church over, you know, worship wars and all those kinds of things that have happened, um, there, there, there can be some mutual fault, mutual wrongdoing, mutual, you know, lack of humility, pride that's gotten in the way. And that's kind of what I was getting at is that kind of, you know, we all may own a piece of some of those kinds of arguments or disagreements. So what do you think is a skillful way that when, to, to let me know that when I'm only seeing my side, what do you think is a skillful way to help me see your, your other, the other side? Well, I, I guess that's where humility comes in, isn't it? If someone cannot look at themselves true and honestly and do an honest look at examination of who they are, then that becomes very difficult. So I think, again, we enter into reconciliation when we are willing to do the hard work with, with ourselves as well as with the other. Right. So it takes a person who's mature and willing to, to get rid of the personality, the persona and get into, get, put the ego outside and let it go. We talked about that when we were talking about repentance, that one of the barriers to repentance is, 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 for instance, pride, self-deception. If I'm self-deceived, well, I'm self-deceived. But it's also why you as my friend, you, you all as my priests, my friends who are there, the people who I trust in my life, I, I need you to have courage with me. Even when I'm, you know, I'm a strong personality and I really can get attached to being right. But I need you to tell me, honey, Got to look at it this time. And, I, and I, I just, I really do want you to have the courage to help me to see. Because that's, that's the piece. That's how we can move back into relationship is to start with letting me see. So I think it's helpful. Are there other things, Casey, that? I just want to say, preach on, brother man. Preach on. <laughs> um, uh, you have uh, someone who um, is wondering uh, about the your preferences with regard to reconciliation versus transformation terminology. Do you are are you persuaded by this um, this recent pivot to the language of transformation versus the language of reconciliation? I th for me, I, I'm, I'm not. It's it does. I I like the word reconciliation. It's why I use it. It, it is meaningful to me. But it's important to me to understand that when we're talking about reconciliation, we are talking about change. We are talking about that there is a transformation, that that's, that is really what's going on. When I, when I, I told you when, you know, what Desmond Tutu said about why the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission would fail was because there wasn't repentance. Telling the truth isn't enough. I mean, I think that's why when we think about repentance and we, 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 we unpacked it, so it isn't just the Jewish shoe of, of turning away from, from sin. It is with the Greek metanoia of understanding that it is with the fundamental change of mind. And I think that if I am engaged in reconciliation work, that yes, there is change and transformation, but it is fundamental. 
that is, and, and so I think it's, as long as we understand that reconciliation isn't to accept just, well, whatever, we just, this is what we have to accept. But we understand that in reconciliation work, we are bringing forward something that, we're bringing something out of the ashes. We are bringing forward new life. I mean, it is, it is, it is the Easter message, is that which was dead is reborn, and that which is reborn comes out of the ashes into new life. So it is changed, it is new. Some people will casually talk about it, well, now we're living in a new normal. That's not what this is about. What we're living in is we have to be living in a, a transformed new normal. So I don't know, I think the question is great and it's probably one that I need to, to think more about. I think we all need to think more about it. But I think that whenever we're talking about reconciliation, it has to mean that we're not just sort of, we're not settling. You know, we're not just sort of, this isn't just conflict resolution where let's just do shuttle diplomacy and just what will we each give up? What we are really doing, and, and gosh, the question is making me just sort of, as I'm thinking of my, just out loud now, so I think that maybe we really should be talking about transformation so we're not confused about what we're doing. It has to be a new life. You know, that which was dead is reborn, but it's reborn into something that, that is, it's new and different and transformed. It isn't, you know, it isn't just sort of a modern apartheid. It's that that was wrong and that's not who we're going to be. Let me see what other questions we have. Rebecca or Nancy, I wonder if you have any um, thoughts or comments too um, in, uh, here as we are drawing today's session to a close. Um, I, as, as I listened to you, I, I wanted you to not talk yourself out of your commitment to, to the term reconciliation. And I, and I, not because I think, I disagree with you, Lee, that, um, that transformation, that change has to be an essential element. It, it absolutely does. There's no disagreement there. Um, but transformation happens in so many different areas of our lives and means so many different things. And when we're involved in, when we're either a party to a broken relationship or we have been asked to accompany two people or groups of people whose relationship has been broken, um, there is something about uh, reuniting, retying bonds that have been ruptured. And for me, the term reconciliation really gets to the heart of that work that we're doing. Um, and I think necess necessarily implies that transformation and change will take place to have those bonds truly be woven back together. Um, so, I mean, so that's where I went on that last question with you. Um, Gosh, this is such a, an important topic and uh, I'm profoundly grateful for the time we've had together to, to think about it. Uh, you, have, uh, you have changed my own sort of forgiveness formula that I've thought about in terms of our family life in some very important ways. Uh, and the thing that I keep coming back to is the necessity of the victim, the one who is harmed, having voice, being heard, expressing um, truth, as we've talked about it today, the truth of, of their story, of their emotional experience of the rupture, um, and the humility of, uh, of, the, of the victim in being able to do that, and the humility of the offender in being ready and willing to listen. So um, I think those are the pieces from today's session that I'll be taking away with me to think on some more. The language, I, I, I think it, 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 it's a really great question. What are we calling it? Reconciliation and transformation. And again, I think it's what it's important is this is, this is, this is sort of this notion of accompaniment, right? It's probably important that we, the people that we're working with to help them transform the conflict, not mm -hmm. just resolve it and settle it, but to transform it, mm -hmm. is what is their language? And to how do we have our language and then how do we, you know, how are we constantly through humility, not imposing our language on those who are in conflict and their process. I think it's, it's just, it's important. You know, it's such an important sort of remembrance. That whole hospice thing, when you stand at the threshold <laughs> and 
you're walking into the room. It's this when you're walking into this. You know, Rebecca, for us as lawyers, that, and we know what, you know, when we're, when we're doing mediations, there's not one conversation that is about reconciliation. They're not trying to transform the conflict. They're trying to get it settled so that everybody can go home, but they're <laughs> not thinking about it like we're this conversation. You know, what we're talking about here is that we are talking about, we are talking about something that is transformation and it's okay with me if we're talking about reconciliation as long as we understand what we're talking about, mm -hmm. the mystery and that God is there in it. Yeah. Um, sure. I am aware of the time. Um, Nancy, do you have a final thought or anything that you wanna make sure to get in before we start to draw to a close? Well, yes. After each session, I just feel so full of thoughts and just excited about what I've learned and what I'm thinking and where I want to go with this. So I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but I know that I don't want this to end today. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to continue this conversation with those who are feeling like me and just feel like we've, we've got so many more places to plumb the depths of this. So I hope that we can find ways to keep it going. And thank you so much. Yeah. I want to just thank you all for letting me be do this and inviting me and me having this conversation. So thank you. We, you know, somewhat arbitrarily picked the four week thing um, uh, because uh, frankly, uh, you know, six weeks ago we thought, well, who knows, maybe, <laughs> maybe we will one day actually not be in our homes. Um, uh, so, um, you know, we, this is a topic that we can bring back around and re-engage from, from a different angle, a different perspective as we go forward. And, and certainly we have left plenty of meat on the bone, um, uh, to, uh, proverbially speaking. Um, so, uh, there will be many opportunities as we go forward to revisit some of this holy, holy matter, um, because it is so fundamental to, um, to health and wholeness as human beings and in relationship with God and one another. So everybody, I, I'm grateful to you all for sticking with us. We went a little long today because partly in, as a result of our late start, um, I guess my final thought is, is, to, is to keep in mind um, that, uh, that we are all headed uh, toward reconciliation. That is, um, that is the end place of all things, uh, that when we speak of the telos, the, the ultimate uh, of all things, that God intends all things to be reconciled to one another and, and, and to God's own self. And so, uh, if anything, in the same way that um, uh, life, that the purpose of life is not simply to get us ready to go to heaven, like to, so our ticket will be stamped, but, but perhaps the purpose of life is to is to get us ready so we might be able to experience heaven when we're there. Um, maybe the purpose of this is not to sort of like, um, you know, um, uh, get reconciliation right, but so that we can grow into the kinds of people who manifest and practice reconciliation um, uh, as we head towards that like ultimate um, uh, telos, that ultimate reconciliation of all things. Um, so if you can't master it today, if, if this class hasn't gotten you to figure out that broken place in your life and how to solve it, that's okay. Um, we are moving there. We are getting there. Um, God is accompanying us, as Lisa rightly says, as we, um, as we become the kinds of people who are able. And as the places of brokenness are slowly, slowly mended um, by God's um, love and care. So friends, um, this class will be back up on the website tomorrow and uh, you can revisit it. Lee, again, we are so grateful for you um, and uh, God bless you all. Uh, peace be with you all and go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. Yeah. Alleluia. Alleluia. That's right. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs>